Good evening. <clears throat> I'd like to bring the uh, finance subcommittee order, uh, subcommittee meeting to order uh, at six o'clock. Uh, Jen, can you call a roll? Councilor Ash. Present. Councilor Kane. Councilor Campbell. Present. Councilor Devine. Present. Councilor DeBona. Councilor Harris. Councilor Yang. Councilor Minton. Yes. Chairman McCarthy. Yes, here, yeah, present. Five members, you have to call them. Thank you. Folks, can you just stand for a second? We'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And before I begin, I'm going to read the open meeting law. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit the meeting to any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recordings or transmissions are being made, whether perceived or unperceived, by those present and are deemed acknowledged and permissible. So <clears throat> this evening, uh, we have a couple of items on the agenda. 2024-030, uh, an appropriation for $20 million for the capital improvement plan for 2024, and 2024-031, appropriation for $4 million, uh, 2024 capital improvement plan, uh, which will be... Um, paid back through the hotel motel tax at some point. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to um, Mr. Walker, who's going to take us through uh, the beginning, and then we'll um, be able to talk to certain department heads and get anyone's questions answered. So, Mr. Walker, it's all yours. Through you, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, thank you um, on behalf of the mayor for the opportunity to present the 2024 Capital Improvement Plan. Uh, we know the council received this information on Friday. So our goal tonight will be to lay out the plan, discuss specifics, answer any questions you may have with the understanding that we have to be back before the body in a couple weeks for a follow-up meeting and we can answer any follow-up questions at that time. Uh, this is a process that has worked in the past and it is certainly appropriate if that's the body's desire to go that path. Um, as you can see from the material presented this evening, th this year's requests focus heavily on public buildings encompassing nearly $16 million of the total $20 million. As part of tonight's presentation, Municipal Finance Director Eric Mason, who's not in the room yet, will give you a brief overview of the financial analysis that you have in this proposal and how we continue to do this and operate well within the confines of Proposition 2 and a half. Commissioner Hines will walk through the details of the public buildings request, and Joe Shea, Principal at Granite City Partners, will provide an overview of the two projects the two projects, including the second, that encompass the second portion of the capital plan, the $4 million allocated from taxes paid by visitors to the city via our hotel motel tax for two exciting park and open space projects. The lion's share of the remaining funding in this request relates largely to standard equipment purchases and the expansion of existing investments. To save a little time, I'll touch on those areas briefly, but those department heads, Ed Grennan from TPAL, Department of Natural Resources Commissioner Dave Murphy, Information Technology Director Brian Glavin, Police Chief Mark Kennedy, Fire Chief Joe Jackson are all here tonight to answer any questions you have on the specifics outlined in the plan. I wanted to touch just briefly on the bigger picture for a couple minutes and talk about the enormity of the scale of what we're talking about when it comes to city assets and what we're all collectively responsible for and how the mayor, working together with this body over the course of many years, um, has made an incredible commitment to those assets uh, to protect them for future generations. Uh, together with, with him, this body has said no under certain terms that we're gonna take care of our public assets. We're gonna leave our public assets better for the next generation. And what we've been able to accomplish together has been nothing short of extraordinary and not something that has been repeated in a lot of communities across the Commonwealth. All told, we have 20, 241 miles of roadway, 240 miles of water mains, 21 schools, four new ones, 59 total public buildings and facilities, more than 50 parks and playgrounds. That number's pushing 60 with the new ones we've added over the last few years. 109 traffic signals, 8,000 street lights, 100 miles of street parkings, and so on and so on. That's a lot of stuff. Uh, and the commitment from the mayor and this body over the years has matched that responsibility. Always with an eye on two things, the need, and the affordability. It's very much like owning a house. 
Sure, you have a property, but can you maintain it? What happens when you let things go over the course of a period of time? You end up paying more in the end. So we've taken that responsibility very seriously. In just the last five years, we've built 62 miles of new roadway. That's about a quarter of our entire roadway system in the city. 31 miles of new water mains, a renaissance of improvements, expansion, and newly built parks and open spaces. New schools, virtually every school <coughs> touched in a significant way. A department created just to handle the necessary improvements and maintenance required at our buildings every day. Vital repairs and new equipment for our eight firehouses across the city. The replacement of a crumbling police department with a new public safety headquarters. All of this and a lot more, all well within our financial capabilities. What's before you tonight is not a ton of new building or new construction, but a vital continuation of the necessary work we've accomplished together. And as I mentioned earlier, I wanted to just briefly hit on, uh, for purposes of the folks watching at home and, and in the audience, um, as I mentioned, um, Commissioner Hines will give a lion's share of the presentation, followed by Joe Shea, but I did want to mention the other departments that are included in this request. Uh, like I said, mostly standard equipment upgrades and expansion of programs we're already in the process of. Um, the Department of Public Works, you'll see several vehicles there, a dump truck, uh, street sweeper, um, some utility trucks, as well as a project to repair and paint uh, the pedestrian bridge at Newport Avenue. The Department of Natural Resources, we would pick up trucks, backhoes, and some standard court repaving at uh, facilities across the city. Uh, TPAL, um, the bane of their existence and ours. Uh, the Four River Rotary, we really want to get going on a redesign of that. Uh, Council Ash knows the issues we have there very well. Um, the rest of uh, TPAL's list is essentially uh, building on what we've already, what, what we're already doing. Citywide traffic equipment purchases, uh, citywide smart signal expansion, and citywide streetlight repair and enhancement. In the police department, it's a number of items, all relatively um, standard in nature. Replacing a new engine with one of our marine boats, a new evidence processing system, uh, ballistic vests, cameras, uh, and uh, police cruisers. Now, I want to make note that cruisers, we have a number of other opportunities uh, to purchase. This one only lists one police cruiser. Um, we know we have to replace our cruisers on a regular basis. They get heavily used, um, especially our frontline cruisers. Um, we have other sources for cruisers, including the annual budget appropriation, including the last CIP um, that included a, a, a more robust vehicle purchase. Uh, and there are some other revenue sources that we intend to use to uh, provide some police cruises to the police department. Um, the, in the IT department, you'll see a couple of vehicles for them and uh, some expansion of the network improvements at uh, Quincy, Quincy, High School, Quincy Public Schools. Um, with that, Mr. Chairman, I would like to hand it over to Mr. Mason. Sorry, Paul. Mason. Mason. Not Hines. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Good evening, Council. Good evening, Mr. Mason. Uh, before I uh, before we jump into the itemized projects, uh, I want I thought it'd be uh, well, so the chief thought it'd be good to go over some of the cursory finances of this CIP, both the twenty million dollar council order twenty four dash zero three zero and the dash zero three one hotel motel uh, pro supported appropriation. Um, from a debt service standing uh, standpoint on this, uh, we really kind of an interesting market right now for the bond sales, which is the primary driver of this is both the itemized expenditures that you're going to see at the department level, uh, but also within the market itself. Uh, we are in a very interesting interest rate environment. <laughs> um, so I'm a little redundant on that. Uh, what we're, we're the general consensus among market observers is going to be about a 75 basis point cut over the next. Um, over the next 12 months, which means the city, as we take on this 20, if the body it chooses and we take on this $20 million in debt, um, is going to be an interesting position to basically uh, to basically use bands to transition into long-term debt after we see an interest rate reduction over there. Now, with that stated, um, as you can see from the bond composition analysis in here, we are using current market interest rates, which are, you know, for long-term debt, we're looking about an aggregate rate of about 3.7%, uh, which is, 
which is kind of be which is kind of to be expected in this bonding environment because um, as we tend to see larger federal deficits boom in this time this time of year. I mean, we just had the discussion of the shutdown. We do see a slight uptick in interest rates. But it also correlates to a drop in tax-free debt, which is what the city will be selling for all these projects. Uh, from a year-over-year -year standpoint, we're looking at a total debt payment on the 20 million mark to start off around 700,000. That's that band payment over the one-year period um, until hopefully we see lower interest rates from the Fed. The climbing up to about $1.2 million and then uh, transitioning down towards the later part of the note at uh, to about $843,000. Now, one of the you know, questions I know we discuss a lot is the effect of the tax to the average taxpayer. It looks like over the course of this 21-year funding cycle, so 20 year, it's going to have 20 years of debt payment. doesn't mean it's a 20-year note. It's a compositional note, so it's made of uh, different terms. Uh, what we see is that the, to the average single-family uh, single tax, uh, sorry, the average single-family tax bill would see about $706 of, of uh, cost over the course of 21 years. Uh, on a per that would uh, relate to about 0.46% uh, debt service to budget ratio over the lifespan of the bond itself, uh, which you know falls right into the range of what we're seeing falling off the debt service over the next uh, five to six years, which would correlate very nicely to what this package is. So um, offers a relatively neutral debt service to budget ratio, which how the city plans out its uh, five-year rolling capital CIPs are usually aimed at about 20 to 25 million. This is a $20 million package. We just had $5.2 million come in for the fire department. Uh, so it falls right in line to some of the other documentation that's been in front of this body. Uh, on the $4 million from the hotel motel uh, fund, that won't have an effect to the taxpayer because it's based on occupancy tax, which is paid for by people who don't live in Quincy, <laughs> coming, coming in here and you know, staying at hotels. Right now, the debt service uh, for the hotel motel fund, if this is approved, would essentially result in the fund having about, over the next couple of years, a few hundred thousand dollars in surplus net. Uh, and as those revenues grow over time, we do expect that to be a larger deficit, um, I'm sorry, a larger fund balance increase. We do not expect a deficit. Uh, Mr. Shea will have a graph that kind of more dives into that, and I'm happy to answer questions now or afterwards on that. Uh, yeah, but overall, this is well within our projected debt picture we've been looking at for the last five to six years and very in line with our former CIPs. So some of this data certainly was probably repetitive to a lot of counselors and I'm happy to answer any questions on it. Oh, sorry. I guess we're gonna jump on you, Paul. Yeah. Good evening, counselors, committee members. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, you have before you obviously the materials on the public buildings portion of the uh, CIP request for this uh, this round, um, there's really not a whole lot of glitz here. A lot of it's very practical, uh, kind of behind the house infrastructure, um, with the obviously exception of the uh, the construction of the the animal shelter on Quarry Street. Um, the first couple of items, uh, the renovation of the engine to the North Quincy Fire Station. Uh, when we had the building apart, the decision was made to move the firefighters' kitchen to the second floor up into the quarters to get that, that kitchen where they both cook and eat their meals off of the truck bay. It was uh, the only access to that, that kitchen was actually from the truck bays themselves. So for purposes of isolation of air and uh, activities, that was moved up top. So we expanded the scope to do that and uh, we're requesting the funding now to, uh, to catch up and, and take care of that. Um, there's an additional $600,000 here for the Kennedy Center. As we all know that's a very vibrant, very busy facility enjoyed by many, many people uh, of our elder population. Um, the problem at the Kennedy Center realistically goes back to its original construction in the 50s. It was poor workmanship at the time. Uh, if you drive and you see on uh, highway overpasses where the steel rebar is protruding out of the concrete and the concrete is all fractured, uh, we were having that same condition underneath the building. Um, we had it probed and the engineers did their things, but without doing destructive probing at the time and causing uh, further concern for structural integrity, uh, they went with certain assumptions uh, unfortunately, they went a little more conservative than they should have. Um, so for expanded repairs, it's not expanded scope, it's the same project, 
Some of the columns uh, sat in salt water for so long that the water permeated through the concrete and the rebars rotted out completely. Uh, and we need to repair that. So that's, that's what addresses the, the 600,000 for the Kennedy Center. Uh, the next one is, is, is the lion's share of this request, and this is the animal shelter up on Quarry Street. Um, the good news is we've gotten to the point that the steel is going vertical, and you can see the building taking shape. Um, and once we hit the restart button, uh, it's gone very, very well, and it's progressing quite quickly. Uh, I've been before this body a, a couple of times in the past, and uh, I read the newspaper, and we read about having hit asbestos uh, in the ground, in the soils. Um, that whole uh, parcel up there, uh, the Avalon and the High Point in the city land, were all part of the Duane Wrecking Company uh, dump in the 50s and 60s and early 70s. Um, as part of the due diligence for the project, um, prior to going to the ground, we did test borings all over a patterned uh, test boring field uh, in accordance to you know, generally accepted industry standards, uh, and regrettably, they missed one. So we had a pretty significant uh, slope that uh, was buried asbestos. The consequence of that was more than just financial. It was uh, immediate shutdown by the DEP uh, because of the health concerns for that, both to the workers uh, and those in the vicinity. So we had to shut down and worked with the DEP through tie and bond, and we filed and got approved what's called a non-traditional work plan. Um, and because of the relationship the mayor has with the Commonwealth and because of the relationship that principles of tie and bond have uh, with the DEP, uh, for the first time ever, the DEP allowed us to relocate in the Northeast region, relocate those soils on the same site, understanding that we put them in a site a portion of the site that was already contaminated and already capped. So we consolidated two fields of asbestos into one and properly capped it under both federal and state standards uh, and that thereby cleaned up the site for the animal shelter fully. Um, that effort took almost to the day one full year. So obviously there was costs associated with that effort um, to get us back to a clean building site and out of the, uh, the crosshairs of the DEP. Um, and so we had the expenses of that, but at the same time we had the expenses of the trailers were on site, the materials that needed to be purchased escalated in cost, the materials that had been purchased had to be stored at whatever vendor they had at a significant charge to us. The general contractors overhead and uh, general conditions continued. Our architect cost us more, our OPM cost us more. Um, everything it just you know, triggered this whole sl slippery slope of uh, added expenses. And one of the other significant portions of it is with the, the ticking of the one calendar year, the prevailing wage rates, which were mandated to pay as a government entity under the statutes uh, increased. So our wages across the board for every tradesperson increased as well. So I did the calculations based upon the budget estimates from the owner's project manager. And, you know, roughly, uh, I don't know, seven years ago or something now, we were before you and got three and a half million dollar appropriation at that time. Uh, a part of that appropriation went to the construction of the road. It was a cost sharing between the dog park and the uh, future a dog shelter, an animal shelter. So we had remaining for this project of that three and a half million dollars, we had two million dollars. Um, then uh, about two years ago now maybe, received a 15 million dollar appropriation. So with the funds from the first one and the, the 15, that gave us uh, 17 million dollars for the project. You have in your packet the revised budget forecast from the OPM that put us at uh, 23.7. So if you take the, uh, the 17 we had from the 23.7, it puts us over $6 million, about $6.7 million. But part of that budget forecast by the OPM had almost $700,000 in contingency costs. Um, and I didn't want to come in and bond for contingency costs, so I cut that uh, from the forecast to the budget uh, and brought it down to the $6 million with the understanding that the submittals are done, the design is done, the contractor's on board. 
we faced the worst thing we possibly could with site conditions, and the building is going smoothly now. So it's a bit of a roll of a dice, but I, I felt it important to uh, be a bit more judicious. Uh, if there's further need, I've left myself 100,000 in contingencies. Uh, if there's need beyond that, we will start doing value engineering, another round of value engineering and cutting from the building, whether it be interior finishes or whatever. Um, the Lincoln Hancock midwinter heat failure, as always happens, it's always in January, it never happens in June. So the rooftop, rooftop unit had to be replaced to heat the gym at uh, Lincoln Hancock. Um, so that's your first section. The next section down goes into some firehouse work. Um, engine six is in need of windows, gutters, roofs, and masonry repairs. It's in significant need. Uh, we have a larger uh, overall project planned for that facility uh, that we're going to phase uh, over time. So it does not appear at this time we'll be moving them out of the building, but we will be doing the exterior envelope. So that's the $2 million ask uh, for that. Again, there's windows, gutters, doors, roof, and masonry repairs. The Point Webster is for replacement windows. They get done sometime before my tenure um, with probably the cheapest replacement windows you could possibly buy, and they need to be done again. The, the air just blows through them. Uh, the next two is the continuing process of our firefighter shower rooms. Um, that's a project that when the council first appropriated monies to buy the extractors and the uh, drying machines for the firefighters turnout gear, that was a limited project. It was the purchase of those and the installation of them. Um, and then when a larger group met and discussed where to put them and the purpose of them and, and, and how to facilitate that, we came to the realization that we also not just needed to clean the turnout gear, we needed to, uh, to clean the firefighters as well before they returned to their living quarters. So we started a program of building shower rooms immediately adjacent to the truck base, uh, which had bathroom facilities, shower facilities, and the, the turnout, clear, turnout gear cleaning facilities. Uh, we're happy to say that we're done with stations one through six. Uh, we have seven and eight left, which is Squandam and Germantown. Uh, Squantum is a bit of an odd building, the way it's laid out in various levels, so it's going to take a more substantial effort than we had hoped or intended originally. Um, and the um, Engine 8, Germantown, we uh, redesigned the way that's going to be done so as to expand their living space into what's currently storage space and utilize existing bathrooms uh, and reconfigure them. So there's expenses with the two of them. Um, there's also one of those things you always have, anyone that owns a home or whatever, whenever you start a renovation, you always uncover the worst that can happen. So I brought a little prop because photographs don't do this one good. That's a steel column that was holding up the Germantown fire station. Not only is it rotted out, but it actually, the load shifted it. That was near collapse. So that and its five brothers were in that condition in the basement of that building. So we're gonna take care of them. Now, um, the next category in my request is for the asbestos abatement. This is part of a series of an ongoing program I've been doing uh, for abating the asbestos out of the school buildings. I'm happy to say we have all known asbestos out of the Wallison School. We have all known asbestos out of Beechwood Knoll, all known asbestos out of the Bernazani School. We're well on our way and, and may complete Montclair this summer. We're well on our way at Marymount. We're doing another substantial abatement at Marymount this summer. Snug Harbor is a huge building and it's everywhere, but we really trained the guns on that facility and we've got a, a large quantity of it gone. Um, the original buildings should be completed of all, all known asbestos by this summer. Uh, and my hope is that for summer of 25, we do the back building where the community center was and uh, the, the early childhood programs and such are. Uh, we don't just go in and take out what's damaged. That's what we're required to do. Um, if we're gonna go in there and tent the room and put everybody in the hazmat suit, we're taking out everything that's in that space. Um, we did so much that the state that we're a B 
BS in them on our records and we got audited because we took out so much asbestos they didn't believe us. So the next three of the categories are boilers. You know, again, not, nothing glitz, no glam here. These are boilers that are leaking on the floor and will not make it next season. Uh, Dave and Paul and the other guys in that group had to really uh, MacGyver those systems to get them through this current heating system, seating there. Season, so hopefully uh, we, this warm weather continues and we don't go back to last week's. Uh, similarly, HVAC related is the unit ventilators at the Beechwood North School. These are the ones from like the circa 1980 edition. The Sawyer Center and the classrooms in that wing have failed uh, and they're not functioning as they should. So while we're currently ventilating the place, we're taking in pure outside air and it's not being heated or cooled. Um, so it's adding to the heating load on the heating system. Point webs to domestic hot water is, as it says, it not only does it have a, needs a boiler, but the domestic hot water heater, once we started our planning on the boilers, the domestic hot water heater started to fail. Um, Quincy High School Auditorium, we move on to, to that building. Uh, it's a beautiful space. Uh, I think really everyone takes pride in its location, and we have you know, Quincy Symphony and other groups that that perform there and people are really impressed by it. Um, but it is aging um, and we have some system failures that need to be addressed in the lighting. Uh, it wouldn't be the first time there was an energy efficiency program conducted there. Um, once again, you know, kind of short-sighted. There were cheaper fi fixtures installed that need to be done again. Uh, we're not gonna repeat that mistake. Uh, you pay more for the labor than you do the light fixtures. So you do it right the first time. Um, the ongoing problem with the gymnasium at Quincy High School, we addressed uh, earlier in our CIP when I said that the company who gave us the quote was Big Ass Fans, and that I wasn't being fresh, that was really the name of the company. Um, we decided to take a pause on that and bring in an engineering firm and have them prove to us that those fans would do what it was uh, represented to us. The engineering firm proved they would not. And rather than those, which I, I was concerned about thinking they'd be targets for the basketballs and the volleyballs, um, the engineering firm that we have engaged has suggested we do destratification de fans. They look like uh, cylinders that hang in the, in the perimeter of the room. If anyone's been in the, uh, the natatorium at the Lincoln Hickok pool as of late, uh, we installed those same type of fans a couple of years ago and made an ama amazing difference there. Uh, again, no glitz here, but three school buildings need immediate replacement of the emergency generators. They keep the, the lights on when the lights go out and that type of a thing. Um, elevators, it's a constant issue. We get aging elevators and code changes happen and control panels go. So it's just, you know, we need to maintain the, the elevators so the buildings lose their ADA compliance. Uh, a number of years ago in the school, were uh, responsible for the buildings. They converted all of the schools from oil to natural gas. Uh, several of the facilities, they left the oil tanks in the ground. And we've targeted most of them, uh, even some unknown ones at the time. Um, but there's one remaining at Atherton Howe School. This is actually in the basement of the school. Uh, and Atherton Howe, like most of our, our schools, is busting at the seams. They need space. So if we can get this tank out of this room, uh, and reconfigure some spaces in the basement, we can gain them uh, living space for their instructional program. Flooring, carpeting, ceiling, that's just an ongoing gig. Uh, North Quincy High School, Point Webster Middle School, uh, the carpets are uh, 20 and 40 years old uh, and need to be done. Um, they not only are unsightly and some, some are stained, but they can be a tripping hazard. Uh, or ongoing program we've undertaken to update the bathrooms in the schools as well to make them handicap compliant. Once you uh, upgrade any bathroom in these facilities, you have to make it handicap accessible as well, which not only is required to be done, but it's the right thing to do. Uh, everybody should be able to uh, use whatever facilities are available. Uh, it helps us with the plumbing code issue too. Some of these bathrooms in these schools are really ancient. There's the original 1912 ones in the basement of Montclair School still in use. Um, they will be done this summer uh, through the funding in the program we did with the MSBA roof project. So that's the ADA compliance for that. It's gonna be the upgrade of those bathrooms. Um, similar with the ADA, many times 
you're required to do an upgrade when you change something. Occasionally, you have to do it pro proactively, whether you change something or not, one of which is our Lincoln Hancock pool. Currently, there's stairs into the pool at one end, and there's a, 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 a lift that people have to come and take, put in place, and get operable to lift a person who, who has disabilities or other mobility challenges to get into the pool. That rig is not compliant, no, no way, no how, um, but the pool itself needs to have a ramp. So we need to do construction of that pool. Um, so we're including uh, the beginnings for that. Uh, roof designs, we have le leaks everywhere in the schools. These, the, this summer has been a killer of the season with the rain this year, they're coming in everywhere. So this provides us a way to design some of the repairs for that. Um, library needs, a good portion of this uh, ask is going to be a handicap ramp on the exterior at the uh, Adam Shore Library. A couple of years ago, we did a complete renovation over a two-year span of that building. It really came out amazing. And, and Sarah Slyman, the new library director, caught us before we put in kind of a plain carpet and uh, steered us in a di different direction and mimics the original carpeting, which looks like the ship's wheel. Uh, and that looks amazing. We've done the bathrooms. We've done the, the other areas of the building but you really can't get in the building. There's a, a sloped walkway behind that's used, but it's not compliant and it's broken. Um, it's got a number of broken areas of, of concrete, so it's a tripping hazard in addition to not being the proper grade. Montclair School Electric, I know we put that in a few years ago. We didn't do it. Uh, we instead basically did an entire rebuild of the basement of that building when we did the asbestos abatement. We built classrooms, we took out 100-year-old heating equipment, created some space for additional instruction there. If you haven't seen it, you would think you're walking down the hallway of a, of a brand new school when it had been wires and pipes and just unsightly things hanging from the ceilings. And it really made a big difference. But we still now need to get to the electric. We did the upgrade in that basement when we did that. We need to catch up with the rest. Uh, the Lincoln Hancock School was built in the 70s, all electric. Federal Pacific breakers, anybody in the trades knows about Federal Pacific, they're, they're, they're not, uh, not reliable. Uh, and so the main switch gear that building, we brought a new transformer in, we're doing work on it, we need to take that next step. Um, the electric room at this point is not compliant with the electrical code or the building codes, uh, just the physical size of it. Uh, we provided for expansion of that a couple of years ago, we did the locker rooms at Lincoln Hancock we capture some space from an old coach's office and enlarge what would be the, uh, the electrical room to make room for the switch gear that we now need to install. Um, Montclair is one of the places that the snowblower and the, is stored inside the building, and that's not a good scene. So when we did some work there a few years ago, we put a foundation outside when we had the, the ground excavated for another purpose, uh, and we're ready to build the flammables shed outside of the building. To, uh, to keep the flammables out of the building. Uh, Parker, we put a, a, a foundation in there as well when we did some work in the past outside of that school. Um, that needs to be designed. That, that structure is not yet designed. That one's actually a little bit bigger to allow for some storage uh, because they have, most buildings have a storage challenge in Parker particularly. Um, Southwest Middle School is very popular. It's already over capacity of the MSBA design. Um, we've added lockers a few years ago. Uh, we need to add some more. Uh, Courtney Mitchell, the principal there, has been very, very patient with me. She hasn't killed me yet, but uh, I fear that day is coming. Um, North Quincy High School Auditorium, you know, it's, it's amazing, but North Quincy High School, the renovation started in the mid 70s. It's been renovated as long as it was old when it was renovated. Um, that facility is dated. Uh, a lot of the systems aren't functioning. It has asbestos. It's not ADA compliant. Uh, so we're advancing a design to bring that up uh, to today's standards. Uh, it, the, just the size of the space, it would never be comparable to the Quincy High Auditorium, but we'd like to do the best that we can. One of the challenges with that facility is that building was built in 1924 to 1925 as a junior high school. So it was built for seventh and eighth graders of 100 years ago, and you see the size of the kids now, they're, they're all monsters, and we're talking seniors in high school. So I, I'm not a big guy, and I can't sit in those rows. 
So we need to pour the entire concrete floor again. So it's, it's gonna be a challenge, but that's advancing. Same thing, we have Mason Avenue issues at North Quincy High School. The front entrance is leaking pretty badly. Um, and we want to incorporate the security desk in that entrance so that one doesn't have to go into the building before they encounter the, uh, the security staff for that building. Um, and I don't know if anyone has seen the auditorium at Broadmeadows Middle School, uh, but it really came out amazing. Um, you would never know the space you were in before. And if you want to do the before and after, go to Atlantic, go to Broadmeadows. They're virtually the same building. Um, Atlantic's is still the 60-year-old relic, and uh, Broadmeadows is brand new, and there's a little bit of jealousy going on. Um, but those students deserve the, the upgraded facility as well, so we'd like to advance that. And that's... To Shay, and then we'll, we'll come back and, and order again and, and hit everybody up for questions. Joe? <clears throat> Thank you, Councilors. I'm Joseph Daniel Shea with Granite City Partners. I'm here tonight to talk to you about Council Order 24-031. This is an appropriation for $4 million for parks and open space and preservation. Uh, it's segregated out because this order would be funded from the hotel motel tax. I'm going to go through the two key park expansion projects that are within the $4 million. Um, and then there are some slides for our CFO, Eric Mason, that we could handle now or handle as part of a, the greater discussion. Um, by way of a little background, the City of Quincy's park network um, is fantastic. Uh, 52 municipal parks, 11 beaches, an array of amenities uh, throughout the whole city. Uh, as we all know, this administration over the last 16 years and uh, Mayor Koch, then Executive Director of Parks and Forestry, Koch is committed to expanding our parks and open space for our citizenry. It's a value he holds very dear. Um, these projects that you see here tonight are an extension um, of that value system. The two components that we're here to specifically talk about within the CIP, funded from Hotel Motel, is the acquisition and removal of 570 South Street, that would allow for the future expansion of the Cleverly Court Park in Ward 2. And I've got some inf detailed information on that. And then also Quincy's Navy Park at Squantum. Uh, this is a passive park that would be dedicated to the men and women of Quincy Sea Service. Uh, it's a park that's being done or proposed in conjunction with some large scale renovations at Marina Bay along the boardwalk. We have a handful of slides for those uh, for that project as well. The two projects combined uh, total four million dollars. For 570 South Street, the acquisition and removal, um, we all know this parcel as the Kilroy Car Wash. It's a six bay passive car wash on South Street just down off of Washington Street before you get to the bend in the road at the Four River Shipyard. Um, you can see from the graphic on the left that the parcel is adjacent to the Cleverly Court athletic fields, soccer fields. Uh, it's also adjacent to a small parking lot owned by the city. Um, I can politely describe that you can fit 24 cars into that parking lot owned by the city, but it's not very well laid out, certainly with eight and nine-year-olds running around after soccer. It's not, the, as a civil engineer, it's not what we want. So part of this um, recommendation or future for this site is not only potentially a field expansion, it's also a parking lot layout expansion and much more efficiency, much more efficient and safe layout. The parcel itself that is being proposed to be purchased is just over half an acre, uh, 0.53 acres. It's got a 3,000 square foot masonry block structure on it, that's six bays. It was built in 1988, and then it has a handful of pieces of equipment like vacuums for those of you who've used it that are not within the building, but the city would be looking to acquire all of that for the purposes of demolishing it. The parcel is business B zoned, although it has a light industrial use currently as a car wash. 
As part of the initiative, and as you may have seen in your package, uh, there's a memo and a detailed breakdown of the $2.5 million. Uh, the lion's share is the appraisal of the property uh, that was done by a certified appraiser, Cusack and Associates. Uh, looking at other car washes that have come up for sale using the sales comparison method. Uh, in your package also are um, demolition and abatement quotes from vendors from the city's on-call list. Um, some uh, tabulations or budgets from DPW who does a lot of paving work on your behalf, so we've got very good, competent paving numbers. Um, and then there is some contingency in the 2.5 million. For the purchase, the ultimate goal is to have some park expansion and parking lot expansion. Here you can see it in conjunction with the 2.8 acre Cleverly Court lot. So it would, would expand the park by about 20%. Um, that expansion would certainly be very useful because this park is normally used only for the U8 soccer program, the little, little ones, because they're 30 by 50 fields. Um, there's not a lot of space there. We certainly maximize the space that we have, uh, and the U10 programs need soccer spaces. But this would give us some elbow room for future expansion. Exactly what that expansion would be uh, would be determined at some point in the future through a process with the Natural Resources Department. This bond before you tonight is for the acquisition and removal, acquisition of the site and removal of the existing building and amenities on the site and the creation of a flat parking area. It, it does not include future recreational facilities. That would be part of another discussion after a process uh, has run its course. The uh, Cleverly Court expansion also would give us some opportunities um, to address, as I had indicated, some traffic. As you're coming around the bend at Pete's Place, that curb cut jumps up on you fairly quickly. Uh, so as cars are pulling in and out, the opportunity to move further away from the bend in the road, I think my civil engineer is bursting out of me, but the, I see this as a, a great opportunity for some safety improvements, not just park improvements. The second project as part of this package uh, is Quincy's Loan, or Quincy's Navy Park at Squantum. We've commonly called it the Loan Sailor Park. Um, but Quincy for several years has been working with the U.S. Navy Memorial Program to become part of the Lone Sailor Memorial Network. Uh, it's a network that honors the men and women of sea service. With our Quincy shipyard and our Quincy Victory plant and the Naval Air Station, we certainly have a great deep history um, of people who've contributed to the success of the divisions of our sea services. A park has been proposed where the centerpiece would be the Navy's lone sailor statue, but a number of other elements are included in this, the funding appropriation before you tonight would fund those elements. Uh, some dedications to some key contributors from Quincy that I will go over. Uh, we have the ship's bell from the USS Quincy and we'd like to put that on display. We're quite proud of that. And then there's a number of interpretive and educational elements that we wish to add. Uh, what I'd like for people to think about is as you see the park on Hancock Adams Common with the history and the educational elements or the General's Park with the history and how we honor our, our military leaders, this park would fall right within the same context as those two locations. As I also indicated for anybody who hasn't been down to Marina Bay this winter, um, Marina Bay Boardwalk is doing massive improvements down there. New boardwalk, new roofs, painting buildings. Uh, we have an opportunity to do some work alongside them uh, for a total renovation of the park at Marina Bay. Uh, the Lone Sailor Memorial is a program we're very excited to be a part of. Um, its mission is up on the slide and in your package. Uh, there are currently 18 Lone Sailor Memorials and we feel that Quincy is a perfect spot for the 19th. That would make Quincy the location for the coastal New England lone sailor. For those who wish to do some research on it, here are some of the other lone sailor locations. 
Um, again, most are in the United States, but there's one in Normandy, France. Seems like a very appropriate place to honor those who arrived by sea. Um, and there's also one in Guam. But you'll see Charleston, North Carolina, Pearl Harbor. There is one in West Haven, Connecticut. Um, and we'd be quite honored uh, through this process to have this park in Quincy, Massachusetts. The park itself, as detailed in your package, um, would be between what we, what we know as Port 305 and Ciro's, uh, nestled on the corner where the statue looks out at the Boston skyline and all of the interpretive elements that are dedicated to uh, notable people from Quincy or admirals from Quincy uh, will be also located in the park. The park is called Quincy Naval Park at Squanum because it's more than just the Lone Sailor Memorial. Uh, it has a number of components to honor contributors from Quincy. Uh, some of the contributors that we've identified to date and with this funding we would be putting up some plaques and some information to support them. Um, as there have been six admirals from the city of Quincy. Um, Colin James Corain, a third star vice admiral. He was a 37 year Navy SEAL. Um, somebody like uh, Admiral John Reddy, three stars, a rear admiral. He made over 1,100 air carrier landings. So those who've seen Top Gun, multiply that by a couple thousand. Um, and we also feel the interpretive elements will be very, very informative. Um, I grew up in West Quincy, just up the street from Stedman Street. Had no idea that Stedman Street's named after Giles Stedman, a two-star general, who, a two-star admiral who received a Medal of Valor. On the notable side are contributors from Quincy, um, some names that will be much more familiar than our admirals. But there's been a handful of people from Quincy who really have done Fantastic work for our sea services, but then also left a wonderful imprint on the city of Quincy. Uh, Mildred Cox, who I'll talk about in a moment. Francis Bellotti. Francis was a frogman, which was a precursor to the Navy SEALs. Frank was one of the first Navy SEALs. Uh, Henry Bosworth with the Quincy Sun. will be writing a lovely story about this presentation in this Thursday's meeting. <laughs> Uh, Richard Stratton, we all know, um, and Charles Francis Adams III was a mayor of Quincy and the 44th Secretary of the Navy. So after leaving Quincy and moving on, he became a Secretary of the Navy. That's fairly influential. The impacts of some of our local contributors, and here is an example, um, Millie Cox. Uh, Millie Cox was one of the first female Marines. She was a proud World War II veteran. After she served, she worked in the Quincy Public Schools. She worked for Veteran Services. She's raised a family, children. I'm happy to know a couple of her grandchildren. I've been watching her great-grandchildren play sports. And uh, Millie recently turned 100. So certainly happy birthday, Millie. Uh, and when you look at a photo like this, this photo is 80 years old when she was a 20-year-old woman, proud, from Quincy, proud to enter the Marines and serve her nation. We are very proud to honor her for all the things that she has done for our nation, for the Marines, and for the city of Quincy. Um, so that's just an example and a great happy birthday shout out. Um, in your package is a breakdown of the Naval Park budget. Um, a lot of hardscape elements, just like General's, General's Park and Hancock Adams Common. A lot of durable materials, granite and brick. We will have an art wall in the Bell Memorial, as I indicated. There'll be tablets for at least 11 impactful people. Then there's associated landscaping, associated electrical work, um, and it's a $1.5 million total budget. Uh, the next slides we can decide, the next slides get into CFL Mason's world um, about the breakdown. And uh, when the time comes, I'm happy to answer any technical questions on either of those two projects. Well done, thank you, Mr. Shea. What I'd, what I'd like to do is, uh, if I could, uh, Mr. Mason, uh, I'd like to bring you back up just to see if, I'll start with you, seeing that you uh, let off, uh, and see if we have any bond questions from the council or any other questions uh, for you, and then we'll just go in order. If uh, Mr. Walker can answer some of the questions for some of the smaller um, purchases that are here, but I see we have 
plenty of experience and department heads out there if you need to ask them a question, but we'll start with Mr. Mason. So I'll start with Councillor DeBona. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wanted to give a few comments and then I'll get right into the funding for a minute. Um, just um, looking back on the history of the CIP, the Capital Improvement Plan, um, just coming onto the council in 2016, um, it was very big talk about to do like an inventory of the entire city and the inventory to get ahead on a proactive approach on some of the issues that may arise down the road. And uh, I know the mayor was going to come into us and, and he did a great job with the packages that we had. And I remember our first one in 2016 within our first few months right around this time in April, it was 19.8 package uh, of a million. So, um, and here we are today um, going in for 20 and as well as four. But looking back on the three years ago, um, in April of 2021, we also had the $100 million roads and sidewalks package. And um, talking to DPW Commissioner Al Gracioso about how to get into and tackle the streets now that the weather is, is getting better. And today was really a breakthrough of weather since we've had a lot of rain. Um, it's been very, very cold for the last few weeks. But um, that putting aside, um, I think a lot of times other counselors over the years were talking about, okay, what's the breakdown? What's the breakdown? You know, um, there's a beautiful package that you put together here that has an itemized breakdown and request by departments. It has the line item. It has the number of uh, how much it costs and then the li lifespan uh, for the bonding. So, you know, looking at, you know, Department of Public Works, Department of Natural Resources, T-BAL Department, Police Department, and then the uh, Department of Information Technology, or IT. And then a whole group of down under the public buildings department uh, under Commissioner Hines, which includes the fire department, uh, library, schools, and ADA upgrades, and all these different things throughout the city. Um, it just breaks everything down. I remember over the years, other councilors saying, "Well, there's no breakdown. This is a, this is a this is a beautiful package put together by by either yourself or your staff." It's a team. It's a team. It's effort. a team. It's a I mean, it it's it's what. Me as a counselor is able to, 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 to look at and understand how, this is how much it costs. This is the project. This is what departments are in. Um, and then also the, the $4 million, obviously, with the uh, capital improvement plan that was going to be paid by hotel motel tax. Um, on the funding side first, and then I'll get into the other questions um, as I can prepare them. Um, what is our long-term debt percentage and what is our short-term debt percentage if this was approved? Um, so if this currently about 9% of our total debt portfolio is in short-term debt, um, you know, that's primarily involving the, the DIF, which will be in short-term debt for, I would say, quite longer duration time than traditionally seen with short-term debt. But that's by design of why Massachusetts General Law Chapter 40Q exists. Uh, so prior to the interest rates coming up, one of the strategies that uh, my office took particularly Ricocia's strategy um, was we locked up a lot of our short-term debt at much, much lower interest rates. Right now, our, the weighted average debt in our portfolio is somewhere in the high twos, low threes. And I think anybody who follows the market regularly knows that is anomalous. Um, I often uh, make a remark in my office that you know, buy, people who bought our pension obligation bond and people who bought our uh, long-term debt last year are probably kicking themselves because the par value of those bonds is probably depressed quite quite a lot, which is good for us. That's that's positive for us. Uh, so right now it's a, a little more than a little less than nine. Uh, sorry, a little less than ten percent, but more than nine percent. And with this approved, uh, we would still be around that that same percentage mark. It's twenty million against a one point three six billion dollar debt portfolio. So it's a uh, it would move those ne that needle too much between the short term and long term debt. So you're consolidating some of the bands, some of the the short term debt. And, and consolidating into a long, longer term debt. Is that what you're doing? Exactly. You're still doing that with the rates being out there the way they are? Right now we're on, we're on a pause from doing that uh, because when, interest, when, when we believe interest rates are gonna decline, you use short term debt to bridge you to when that debt has fallen, those rates had uh, fallen. Uh, uh, the reverse of that is you think interest rates are gonna rise in the future, then you try and lock up uh, long term bonds quickly as possible. So before the interest rate increase about 18 months ago, we jumped in there, we got, we, lo we locked up a lot of our short-term debt, which is mostly school-related debt, um, to those much lower interest rates. Interest, rate, interest rates went up, 
and now we're back in front with the CIP plan. We're going to see the, the falling action of that. We're going, to, we're going to bridge our way hopefully to next year. Just looking at the items that we have in front of us, a lot of them are for vehicles and stuff, and, and it looks good. And, and a lot of them are obviously in the public buildings department. Um, just just kind of looking back and, and, and kind of like you guys did the whole presentation. Now I kind of have a couple of questions for different things. But um, on the MSBA, does any of these qualify for any reimbursements or is this just the area that we, we have to tackle without anticipating any MSBA reimbursements? None of these projects are, are uh, under that. eligible for reimbursement either under the core program, which is the substantial renovation or building a new building, or the accelerated repair. The accelerated repair, MSBA has actually pulled back the Parker School that we've got currently under agreement with them and funded is probably the last boiler room that's going to be done. Uh, they've stopped that. They're just going for windows, doors, and roofs. Okay. Um, getting on to this 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 $4 million hotel motel tax, um, uh, the acquisition, obviously, of the car wash. Um, I, I know over the years there was a lot of issues at the soccer field with irrigation and flooding concerns that obviously had to rain out several games. Is, are you anticipating mitigating a lot of that flooding that occurs over there uh, in the Cleverly Court area um, with this new revised 20% uh, edition of the, of the, of the soccer fields? Um, easily, yes, that is an opportunity that this presents. The car wash is further up elevation-wise. Uh, when you drive down Cleverly Court and you look across, you can see that the parking lot has a retaining wall which raises it up. Uh, we would be looking in the cost estimate, you can see retaining walls um, in the 2.5 million for the purposes of trying to deal with wet weather, wet issues in that field. Um, the budget does not include raising the whole field. Again, that would be part of potentially a future program. Mm -hmm. Because I, I know many, um, it's probably been about four years ago, there was, there was some talk with the Quincy Youth Soccer League, um, with the board, that the mitigation of water and, and, and just the flooding, you know, it was raining out certain games and we were running into issues and obviously we didn't have the funding in place to, to do this. Um, it seems like when, when we go and tackle this, this uh, situation, I think it'd be the best, you know, I know this happened at Kincaid. And I know the price tag was at the time was 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 quite high, but what we didn't realize is this there was some issues with, you know, um, I guess there's ledging out there, or or you know we had to remove a lot of different areas for the flooding purposes, and um, I didn't didn't really know that specifically. Uh, poor Ward Four Councilor was kind of like, well, what what happened? But I didn't know the full scope of it, so I know that this does have flooding, and down the road maybe hopefully this will be mitigated as well to get the kids on the on the fields, obviously, you know, we got Adams Field and the different fields that we have across the city. Um, the flooding is an issue, especially with the rains that we had over the last couple of weeks. I mean, it's just, you know, getting on the fields has been really, really tough. So um, I think everything else in the package um, looks to me like their, their needs. And I, I always talk about the CIP, are, they, are these needs or these wants? They, these look like needs. Uh, I think you guys did a great inventory each department and a punchline, and you added this all into this package. So, um, looking forward to the Lone, Lone Sailor Memorials as well uh, in the Marina Bay that complements it throughout the city. But um, the hotel motel will repay this back. Is that how it's going to be repaid? The $4 million? That is correct. So, um, I thank you. Uh, thoughtfulness on the, the two projects that will be paid back. Um, and the CIP. Um, it looks like it's it, every little department out there is getting a little bit of sprinkle to get them get them working. Um, if this was approved going forward, when will this money monies be um, available to start these projects or order order these vehicles? Um, and if any of these vehicles, how long does it take for the turnover for them to be in house in the city of Quincy? Uh, from a funding available standpoint, counselor, uh, almost immediately it'd be pretty much immediately. And we have enough liquidity in the city. We average about $125 million in liquidity balances mm -hmm. that we'd be able to support this while we wait for the bonding to occur. Okay. Uh, so a lot of the things you're seeing in front of you would be able to be financed, would, have, would be able to be purchased virtually immediately. I, it's a great phrase that I always, um, as well as the needs versus wants, is pay now or pay more later. 
it. So you obviously you know that, that it can be the prices go up. So yeah. uh, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate you the line items and the itemized per per department and per per line item and project. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. The chair recognizes Council Yang. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just want to start by uh, commending actually the department heads that are not just here, but all of the work that you do behind the scenes to put this together, working with your staff and team in doing so, because you're running your department's day to day to begin with, but then on top of that, to take a step back and find whatever uh, little hours are left in a day to work with your teams and put this together, I think is pretty incredible. So to all the department heads here, I just really want to thank you for showing up, but also putting this together and, and, and the time you took to put all of this together. I'm not here to question your expertise on that, right? I'm more so curious about process to make sure that I'm being accountable to the work that's getting done. And then of course, making sure that I'm keeping in touch with all of you as folks ask questions about this as it moves along as well. So I'm just gonna sort of go through questions that I marked up through this booklet um, as you all gave the presentation. So if I sort of pause, I'm a little bit all over the place. Is this because I'm trying to just follow where my notes are on these different pages? So I might be bouncing back and forth between the three of you. Um, the first question I have is just on the sort of beginning part of this packet, there is um, a tab with the public buildings and infrastructure um, summary. It says investments include upgrades to fire stations, schools, and city buildings. Um, and then you go into detail later on about that, but I didn't see a timeline. So I saw some breakdowns with quotes with pricing. And I do know that you can't set an exact timeline until you even know if you have the money for it. And so I'm not looking for dates necessarily. If you could, though, at least, it doesn't have to be tonight, right? Because I know tonight we are just being presented a lot of information that we can then process, but that would be helpful for me is just understanding, you know, again, not dates. Like, I don't need you to say to me, okay, well, you know, August of 2024 through, you know, May of 2025 is when this is gonna happen. It's more so like how many months will it take to you project for certain things to get done in all of these categories? So again, the upgrades to the fire stations, right? And all of those different pieces of work in the fire stations, do you anticipate some things will take, you know, three months, 10 months, 12, whatever it is. So again, just for the accountability side of it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have that today and you can share it, great. If not, again, that's okay. If you could send it to us after the meeting, um, it just would be helpful to understand, like, if the funds are approved, how long do we all foresee, like, this work to take place over the next year, two years, et cetera? The, the quick answer is these are nearly all immediate, but I will prepare a uh, specific line by line for you and we'll email out to all the counselors. Thank you. It's just helpful too to understand how much work you're taking on, right? Because again, it, it's like if a lot of these projects are, are year plus long projects, you're taking that all in your department and that informs me about resources that you might even need, right? To, to see some of that work get done. So it's just for me again, really informative about process. That would be really helpful. So I appreciate that. Certainly. Um, the next thing is with the um, police department upgrades. So there are allocations for the police department in here. And again, some of the details were later on in the packet, but are any of these um, improvements to the public, I'm sorry, to the police department going to be tied to the existing building that can't be moved over? Or are all these improvements able to be moved over to the new building? I, the reason why I'm asking is I just wanna see like are the funding for any of the police department upgrades that are really about the, you know, the radios and the marine engines the processing systems, et cetera. Like these are all things that can be, again, moved over and still utilized when the new building's open, right? Like nothing's being spent that will just like leave with the old building. Do you get what I'm saying? Uh, thank you, Councilor. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, a lot of the upgrades are gonna be moved into the new building. One of the things that we're looking at now when you see, for instance, the evidence, the upgrade to the evidence system, we're gonna have to move all the existing evidence that we have into a new building while maintaining a chain of custody for the district attorney's office in any cases going forward. So what we're looking to do is buy a system where we can actually catalog every piece of evidence and maintain a chain of custody as we move into the uh, much better and more uh, uh, up-to-date evidence rooms that are gonna be in the new building. But in terms of the radios, a lot of those are uh, the handheld radios that obviously are gonna go to the individual mm -hmm. offices and the radios that will go inside the new cruisers. Great, okay, thank you. Nothing Appreciate really uh, that is gonna be going down with the new with the old building that's exactly how i meant to ask right going down with yeah. the old building so nope. thank you i appreciate right. that thank um you. eric this one's for you for the debt service to budget ratio council devon was asking about our short-term and long-term debt but i'm more so curious about um our overall debt to budget ratio because uh from a very very thorough presentation i received many years ago uh something that has always stuck with me is that our debt to budget ratio 
uh, really informs our bond rating. And so what is our current bond rating right now? Uh, our current bond rating is uh, it's double A stable. And that's by Standard & Poor's. Okay. And do we have any room to go up from there? Do you remind me? It's a it's a constant discussion we have with uh, with Standard and Poor's. Basically, after the pandemic, they downgraded every community, every municipal uh, bond across the entire country, um, and that had to do with a couple like some labor market issues and stuff like that. And the labor market really still hasn't repaired since the pandemic, especially in the public sector. Um, so we really haven't seen any broad market increases in municipal debt ratings. Double A is incredibly high quality debt. So that little marginal difference between double A AA and triple A. Uh, we don't really see any savings in interest rate. You're talking maybe 15 to 25 basis points on a 20-year note. Um, the, the taxable side makes it much more advantageous to the average buyer. So well, we could always go up higher. It, it, I just I, I don't think it's likely not just that Quincy wouldn't go up. I don't think any municipality in Massachusetts is particularly going to go up. Okay. I'd be very impressed if somebody did, to be honest. Sure. Um, and what's our current debt um, to budget ratio? Do you uh, know? Debt to budget or debt service to budget? Debt, I believe it's debt to budget, right? What is the one that informs it, the the uh, bond rating? Um, they they both do. So debt service to budget ratio. That's uh, how much debt we use to service a note throughout the year. Mm -hmm. uh, that's currently about seven point one seven percent. Um, and then the debt to budget ratio, which is our total debt portfolio okay. divided by our budget, is about three. So okay. it's a little more than three. And then. What's the range right now that, do you, do you know what I'm referring to, oh, that yeah, range absolutely. is? So uh, I believe, Councillor, when you, uh, uh, the presentation you're, you're referring to was we're trying to make, keep our debt service ratio between, debt service to budget ratio between 6% and 7.5%. Got it, okay. Basically, you don't, the rating agencies don't want you going over 7.5% because that's increased burden to service that debt. They don't want you going lower than 6% because that tends to show that you're not investing in the current assets you have. Correct, right. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, moving on. So, okay, for the, the vehicles, um, I imagine some of them, particularly with, you know, public safety things, can't be uh, electric vehicles because they simply don't exist. But for any one of the number of vehicle purchases in here, like pickup trucks, I mean, was that explored? And you can be honest with me if it wasn't, right? But, like, was that, was that explored to, to move in that direction? Because if we're looking... It's so distracting sitting next to him now because I can see him doing this versus when I was like sitting over there. But um, I'm just thinking again, like we're we're doing these capital improvements with the long term goal in mind, right? And so I I know a the availability and b the affordability of electric hybrid some combination, right? Like it's not great right now. It's it's pretty through the roof. Even like buying regular gas vehicles is is through the roof right now. So I'm not trying to sit here and say, can you go spend more money? But if in the long term that is beneficial, then maybe, I forget Councillor Demona's one or two phrases that was great over there, right? Like spend more now, spend more later. You know what I'm saying? Like, was that explored? Was that a conversation that was had? And if so, why are we not moving in that direction? Or maybe we are, and I just don't see it in front of me. Through you, Mr. Chairman, I, I apologize. I was pointing to him. To, like, <laughs> but I'll, but I'll the, I need like the blinders on. This. I'm 75 percent Italian, Council. Mr. You're President, gonna you're going to have to move me. So. You're going to see my hands move once in a while. Um, the, the short answer to the question is yes. Um, we have um, a de facto uh, electric option mm -hmm. when we look at purchasing new new vehicles. Um, between the departments that are involved, between municipal finance, between our office, between the school department, we always pursue the availability mm -hmm. and the practicality of electric vehicles. And right now, and you said it exactly correct, it's both the availability and practicality um, are not in great shape uh, relative to the overall uh, car market. Um, we've, there's been a number of studies, a number of reports over the course of the last several years about um, the reliability of some of the electric vehicles that are in the market, that, that, that the technology hasn't necessarily matured to where our departments, the mayor, um, and the folks that are involved are 100% comfortable with making wholesale changes. Now, some of these things, uh, a street sweeper, yes, a electric street sweeper does exist. Oh, it does? Uh, it, it does exist, but it is okay. ludicrously expensive and the reliability is not been tested yet. Mm -hmm. So sure, we could make a statement that, you know, we're gonna go buy electric street sweepers, but the, the, 
the frank truth is that we're just not there yet, mm -hmm. uh, infrastructure-wise. And by we, I don't mean the city of Quincy. I mean all of us, the country uh, in general, the, in terms of reliability, in terms of the grid, in terms of everything else that we need to make that full transformation to electric. We're not just there. We're not. We're mm -hmm. just not there yet. Um, to that end, you know, we do look at availability and the practicality side of it. Okay, thank you. It sounds like there is a commitment to at least explore it, and so I, I do appreciate that. I mean, I think I've seen once, it was either like an electric or hybrid pickup truck, and it looked pretty awesome. I mean, like the grill was really intense. So like if our city employees want to drive those around and the offshoot is and then we get a hybrid vehicle, like let's let's do it. They look great and it's good for the environment. So I'm no, I appreciate that you, again, at least look into it every time. If I may, I've got something to add, but first look at his face because I stood up. Um, <laughs> I can't. I have to blinders, okay. <laughs> anticipating the solve for the supply chain and the reliability and the others, we do in the public buildings install the electric vehicle charging stations. Mm -hmm. We're provided for them at the Christopher Center. We're providing for them at the animal shelter, um, even the public safety headquarters. We have uh, a number of the spaces in the parking garage are, have the conduits run to them. We'll have the charger heads there. But we also put in underground conduits and transformer pads to allow future growth in that same building when and if we do get to a more electrified fleet, the infrastructure is in the ground ready for it. That's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, okay. Then, again, this is a lot of process questions, so just bear with me. The, for the citywide traffic signal equipment purchase, um, how I'm just curious, how did the prioritization of where those city lights are going to go, what was that process? Because... Um, all I can think of right now is, you know, with the DPW, their massive, massive continued overhaul of the streets, the sewers, the sidewalks. I mean, it's incredible, and it's really impressive work. Um, and, you know, I, I had the opportunity to go in many years ago to sit down and understand, like, how that process works, right? Like, with so many, obviously, streets and sidewalks across the city, right? Like, there has to be a process about determining where do you start and then how do you prioritize that work? So this is really, again, not me questioning your ability. It's really curiosity, right, about process. Like, how do you and your department determine where you're going to start? And then when requests come in, how those requests can sort of be slotted into these, these priority areas? Sure. So the, the main issue that we try to address is uh, serviceable life of some of these intersections. Um, is long past. So the list that you see for today's ask, the five locations, all five of those locations are cabinets that are held together with like chewing gum and uh, light bulbs, basically. If you were to open up the cabinet, uh, you'd probably be horrified as to the condition of them. Um, so, so bubble gum, that's usually like the, okay, we need to replace that. Is when you see yeah, that. they're intersections. Okay, we deal sense. with like reliability issues, like these five intersections, um, oftentimes like nights, weekends, when we get storms, wind, water, um, we have like ongoing maintenance issues there. They go into flash. Uh, once the intersection's on flash, mm -hmm. uh, the pedestrian facilities don't work the way that they're designed. So um, that's why these were identified as priorities because they need it the most right now. Great, okay. Do you anticipate um, coming in front of us again pretty frequently? Because again, with ZPW, it's a continued ask, right? Like th there's an ask, the work gets done, we keep going and, and it's been, I think, fantastic progress. And so that's something that I think would be really exciting for your department as well. I don't know if you have that sort of in mind or if you're just like, I just want to address this now and come back to it later or. Yeah, so we sort of have, we have multiple streams right now. We have the, the streams of this is an impending issue that we're sort of trying to get ahead of immediately because uh, frankly, to expect these intersections to continue to function correctly is kind of a, it's a stretch. We, um, we're addressing issues that we know are going to be major headaches if they go down while we don't have this funding in place. Now, mm -hmm. the, this body and the mayor have been very um, generous in allowing us to sort of take a wide look at our system as a whole. We do have 109 signals. Um, we've upgraded many of them in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, we do have a running list of capital improvements that we'd like. We'd like to get to each and every one of these signals. Um, and we'll continue to work down the list as you know, we can and when funding becomes available. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. I appreciate it. Uh, some more questions about electric vehicles. Oh, so the acquisition of uh, 57580 South Street. I'm just curious, how much is being taken off the tax rolls with that property if we purchase it? 
Is it millions and millions and millions of dollars, or is it insignificant? Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Great question. I anticipated that one. Um, $15,800 is the annual tax bill based upon current taxes for that parcel. Okay. And I know that there was um, some information about that if it wasn't um, being considered for a purchase, that likely it's going to be built up as more condos or apartments, right? Uh, it would certainly go to market, and that would be one of the highest and best uses. Got it. Okay. Um, oh, and then for the hotel motel tax, how much do we have in that um, account right now? Sorry for being so whiplashy again. I'm just sort of going through as, as the booklet is running through. Uh, there's 1.956 million in there, Councillor. Are we using any of what's in the, um, are we using any of this 1.9 in addition to the 4 million or, or as part of, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just curious, no. are we just not touching what's in there right now? No, and this is, that particular one is the open space section, which is pertinent to this. There's another historic preservation one that account 4513 that I'm sure the body and the auditor is familiar with. Um, but for this, there's no fund balance change from this. This is just ongoing debt support. I see. Okay, I got it. I got it. Okay, and then what is the total? Um, so it wasn't the slide; it's in the booklet. the The two pages that you hate you, that you that you uh, gave to us that you put in front of us. One is the composition of the projected bond offer for the twenty million, and then one for the four million. And there's a breakdown of um, total payments. But what's like the full total when all is said and done for the payments? Like, so what's the full payment going to be after? Um, Twenty forty four when we were done paying off the twenty million. The total payment would be the uh, the sum of that column B, which um, you know, given the prevailing. I can system, add it. I was kind of hoping I didn't have to sit here and do it. Yeah, I mean, like <laughs> I know I can do the like math on the phone. Seconds, but... I could probably get you a pretty close number. But, okay. Yeah. If you don't have the total, yeah. it's okay. I can I can sit here and use my phone. But I just figured I'd ask in case you had it in front of you. I, I want to know what the total is when we're done with it. What what the total uh, amount that we would have paid out is. Yeah, I, I, my, my estimate would be somewhere in the low. My iPhone's not going to support all of these, like, seven, eight numbers in it, so I was really hoping that you would just have the total, but um, I can do the math on that. Don't worry about it. Um, I think that's all. Oh, I'm sorry. And then the last thing I had was just with the, in the book, like, the outstanding invoices, and then there's an attachment of, like, projected invoices to come in the future. It just How did we determine all of the different vendors that are in here? Did you all get, like, there there is a process legally, right, that we have to do RFPs before we decide to go in forward with any vendor, even if we've like had history with them, we do still have to go for an RFP for all of these, right? You, you are correct, Council, and I'll okay. let uh, Commissioner Hines weigh on this if you'd like to, but yes, so we have to go through it. A lot of it is a combination of, if it's spot work, we have something called on-call contracts, which are pre-negotiated rates uh, under goods and services deals. Okay. Some of them are RFPs with pre-designed money included in there too. Uh, but yes, there is a very, uh, procurement law, and, particular in the state masters is just, it's quite aggressive and we uh, I would say uh, our our ERP our accounting system is more about procurement than it is about journal management yeah I mean it happens but I just I wanted to make sure um, that the numbers in these invoices that were put in front of us had already gone through a process of consideration to obviously find the the best offer with the best value for for the dollars that we're putting forward so I appreciate that um, that's all I have thank you everybody for um, answering all of my questions I appreciate it thank you mr. chairman Thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, Chair recognizes Councillor Ash. If I could, um, Commissioner Hines, I just have one quick question. Um, with respect to the breakdown here, which is great, um, your sixth line item says Point Webster Engine Three Window Replacements. Is that for the middle school or for the oh, sorry. for the fire? It should house? be Quincy Point. It's Quincy okay. Point Fire right. Station. I, I figured that based on what you said. I just want to make make Quincy. sure. I'm, Quincy, Clear. Um, the Point Webster School windows is something I like perpetually put before the MSBA. We're just just about of the age range now that uh, we're hoping for success next round. But this is for the fire station. Okay, I, I had to ask because I can imagine both could both could be replaced. So you know, <laughs> uh, all right. Thank you. Um, and then uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, majority of the. Discussion I wanted to have was uh, regarding 570 to 580 South Street. Uh, Mr. Shea, if you don't mind. Um, I did have the opportunity to look over the proposal um, currently in the ward right now. As many people know, we're um, having continued community meetings on 10 Independence Ave. Um, there's a proposal going in at the uh, JCBT lot on the corner of Washington and Chubbuck. I used those two examples, as Mr. Shea alluded to a moment ago. 
um, this car, the car wash could very well be uh, purchased by a developer. And uh, we've seen a uh, uh, couple dozen units easy. Uh, it's seeming to, that could potentially be the future for this lot um, should the city not purchase it, which is the main uh, reason as to why I think it's a great idea. Certainly, I don't, I don't know if we'll be voting on it tonight um, or if it'll stay in committee, but either way, um, I'd encourage everyone's support for that reason. Um, the, if, if I could ask you, the, the Joy Hanlon Field, does the city own that property right now? Or if you could go over that ownership, that'd be. Um, I can, the, the, the city owns the Cleverly Court Park. Um, that consists of a parking lot and two fields, um, the Joy Hanlon field and the Malcolm McNeil field. Okay. Um, so the, they're both soccer fields. They're undersized soccer fields, but everything in green the city currently owns, the proposal is to add the blue, um, and that would end up with about 3.3 acres, 3.2 acres in total space uh, for the city's use. Understood. Is, was that lot recently, was, was that a state asset? It, it, did I, do I have that? Um, it is not the city. Head? The city has been pursuing the the MWRA owned Cleverly Court lot, which would be a, a piece of pavement on the left side of this screen across okay. the street uh, that the city has expressed some interest for several years in acquiring from the MWRA. Uh, the MWRA has been kind enough to allow the city to license that land. So the city has been using it for construction, staging, and storage. Um, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Chris Walker, the Chief of Staff, because I'm sure it is still the city's intentions to get a hold of that land. Through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we, we have that site now, Council. Okay. Terrific. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't change much of, uh, you know, my uh, support for the project, certainly. Looking at, at that area, um, I'd be nervous to put a big development over there. I know that some of the residents in that neighborhood would appreciate it. There is not a ton of passive enjoyment land use um, in that section. You know, you got the shipyard right there. Um, and so having some additional amenities over here, certainly to open up the discussion in, in the hopefully near future of some improvements to the actual park itself, um, I think is great and beneficial. So thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Councilor. Well said. Councilor Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I don't have much to say. I'm, I'm grateful for We've come a very long way, as Councilor DeBona highlighted over the past nine years. The capital improvement plans used to be presented like this, and now they're presented <laughs> like this. So I'm given all the data and information that I need to make an informed decision. Um, so thank you very much uh, to all the department heads and to uh, you, Mr. Shea, uh, for all this work. And on that, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Motion uh, on the table here to, to approve. Uh, anyone on the motion, any other counselors? Uh, Councilor Devine, would you like to speak? Uh, I'd like to reiterate what Councilor Ash said and uh, get, you know, give them the support. The uh, Cleverly Court area, I've watched uh, it's a great looking field and a lot of kids are playing down there all the time uh, with the programs that they have. And, um, you know, they're parked everywhere. And I think you said they're seven and eight and nine year olds with a lot of energy when they get there first, maybe not when they leave. So to have the parking lot and have them off the street and not using the side street as much to get in there sounds safer. And uh, safety for kids is very big to me. And uh, so I would like to reiterate the support for Councilor Ash and that project. It sounds really good. And then um, just a quick question for uh, Director Hines or Commissioner Hines. Uh, the Early S Learning Center, that's De La Chiesa? Yes. And it's getting the emergency electrical generators. Will there be any other uh, work being done to that? I, I thought I heard that there were some issues with maybe the HVAC or the... There is a challenge with the HVAC system there. Um, my understanding at this point, the current students from that program, the early uh, the preschool program there, will be moving to, to Cristofaro. Sure. That'll give us uh, the availability of, of doing work in the building. I don't know the timetable of that. 
both as to when it starts and the duration of it. We have had a new HVAC system designed for that building. It's probably been on the shelf for about five years. We're actually taking a look at it to kind of mix it up a bit and do 100% electric. Um, oh, okay. See if we have the inter infrastructure that allow us to get rid of the boiler room, gain some educational space. Um, you know, you, you, if the grid goes green, it's more environmental. Um, so we're taking a relook at that one. Okay, uh, great. Uh, thank you. I don't know how you keep all those buildings in check. Yeah, you do a great job. Uh, clearly, I'm brand new, so I didn't realize that we didn't get this extensive uh, book, but it it's pretty basic. Uh, you have all the numbers and everything there, so that's great. Thank you for all your work and all the directors and commissioners here. And then for Councilor Liang, as far as uh, Director Grennan, the best way to work on that is going to his office. They have a whiteboard. Erase wherever you are online and put it on top, and that's the best way. There's a chair. There's a chair. That works better than you think. But I want to say thank you very much. I appreciate uh, everybody's time. That you always open your doors to me, so uh, it helps me um, answer the questions and, and do my job. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Any other uh, any other comments from the councilors? Councillor Ash. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Director Grennan, if I could just, uh, I don't know if we're doing full uh, presentations from everyone or if we're voicing our questions all around now. Okay. Um, if you could just touch on, um, Director Grennan, thank you very much. If you could just touch on the four of a rotary reconstruction design project. Sure. So the, the funds requested here tonight are um, to start the process for a full redesign of that intersection. Um, over the, the past few years, we've been watching the trends of crashes, um, primarily coming over the Four River Bridge, uh, single vehicle crashes that are going into the rotary. Um, there's a number of crashes and the severity of them is very high. Uh, there's an injury rate, I believe it's 43% of crashes there result in injury. Um, which is atypical for Quincy. So the $300,000 that's requested here is uh, to start the process of um, a full-fledged TIP project redesign and reconstruction of that intersection. So the $300,000 will allow us to identify a on-call, um, maybe not on-call, we may do an RFP for a design consultant, um, identify the project, do all the analysis, survey, um, and sort of help guide us through what we anticipate to be a, a long process with the state and the MPO for funding. Uh, there is definitely going to be additional design funds <coughs> needed for this. Um, it's hard to say, but it, I would suggest like at some point, like the total cost of this design would probably be around three quarters of a million dollars. So this is really step one. Mm -hmm. It's to get us on the schedule, it's to get us um, move in on what we think is a important improvement to be done here. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Grennan. Uh, so I have a motion by Councillor Kane to approve. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Um, thank you. Now, was that on the first one, the 20 million, Councillor Kane? Just on the... Yeah, so I'd, I'd be looking for a motion on, motion by Councilor DeBona on the $4 million bond. Um, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it, so take care of that too. So 2024-030 and 031 are, are approved. Uh, thank you. With that, I will uh, move to adjourn.